this dog is that video showing for you folks now it is okay good so you can see these off lead tracking dogs were pretty fast and we had to really run to keep up and on vegetative surfaces it really worked well even when you had just road crossings and things like that the dogs could work it out and figure out where they were going but where we ran into problems was when our world shifted from this kind of an environment to this kind of environment. All of a sudden, things got more difficult for us. So um, what we found was that we had to come up with a solution that would work for us. And we'll talk about hit in a moment. But I want to show you where it went. The dog you're going to see right now is a dog 15 years later than the video you just saw. Well, actually about maybe make, make that about 10 or 11 years later. And he's halfway through his training. He's not done yet. But our standard is that the dog in an urban environment should be able to start in an, from a car in the middle of an open parking lot and follow the track for us. And this dog right now, again, halfway through his training, um, about, you know, about eight, eight to 10 weeks into training, uh, is now searching for the start of the track. The handler doesn't know where this track is. And as he um, lets the dog process the start, his job is just basically to make sure the lead doesn't get in the dog's way and let the dog do the work. And you can see um, this dog here is moving along. Um, there are uh, small treats on the ground. So every once in a while, you see the dog pause to stop them. In this particular case, they're probably 30 to 40 feet apart. And they consist of, um, I have, at this time, maybe it might have been morsels of hot dogs or um, a little bit of jerky treat. Um, you'll see up ahead as we come through this parking area, a car off to the left and a person walking toward the loading dock up in front. Uh, this person actually drove across the track that he's going to have to negotiate here uh, a little bit ago. And you can see the dog is focused on his work doesn't really care about the people in the area, the car sitting there with its door open or anything like that. And um, Kirk's now letting him process and work the turn. And the dog makes the turn going down the, uh, the pavement right here. And this system starts on pavement. And so the dog's perfectly comfortable working on it. Um, I could, for the sake of time, I'm going to cut this short, but you could follow this track. And essentially what you would see is that we're going to go down past that vegetation up there to the right, make a curve around the, uh, there through another parking lot. And the dog will have a toy hidden there that he gets to go pick up and they'll have a nice tug game to finish it off. But we'll go ahead and move on because we do have time constraints. So the one thing I want to tell you is that we shouldn't be afraid of pavement. We've got to learn to embrace it. But the problem is most of us start in a way that makes pavement a problem for us. And we'll talk about why that is and how it goes a little bit later. But rather than fight that, embrace it. Lean into the pavement work and it will get a lot easier. But you got to build your reinforcement history the way it will work out for you. And we wound up doing it by looking outside our industry, out of the police canine, and looking at some sport trackers that had come up with some stuff, and then we modified that. So everything you're seeing is borrowing off of other people. I'm a firm believer that if anybody sees farther than anybody else, it's only because they're standing on the shoulders of giants, to borrow uh, from Sir Isaac Newton. But as we go through this, this problem that we, we had was something we created ourselves, and in the end, we realized the problem wasn't the problem. It was actually the symptom. And it was a symptom that our behavior change for tracking was built the wrong way. We built it from the middle and worked out towards the ends. We started teaching tracking before we really had a solid report behavior and really had taught the dog properly how to, uh, to search for the start of the track and get itself well established. Once we, and, and we did this, the traditional way. I can remember, I can't count the number of times where we did runoff tracks. Somebody would hold the dog, you disappear around the corner, go down the, a little bit, take a left, take a right, hide behind a bush, the dog would come and find you. It built a lot of intensity, dogs that love to get to the end. And everybody would gauge how 
well a dog was tracking by how hard they pulled when it actually we found that that arousal got in the way of the kind of performance that we needed in an urban environment. You know, the, that party at the end created something that the dog really loved to do. It could be the person they loved. It could be the tug game or that you played with. It would be the start of some sleeve work or a really rigorous fight at the end. The dogs really loved it. But unfortunately, what happened was, is they would get so wrapped up in whatever happened at the end, they forget about the means. And the means is that focus tracking that we needed. And the way we did it in those old days, oops, why am I stuck here? My screen is not moving. We did stuff on vegetative surfaces first. As you saw, we worked in, in cemeteries. We worked in parks. We worked on um, uh, other property that had vegetative surfaces, road edges where there were planting strips and things like that. We always had somebody at the end, every time. And um, we taught articles once the dog had started learning to track, but wasn't truly proficient. And all the articles became was maybe a point if you were lucky, a dog would check off and say, okay, I'm on the right track, but he still wanted to get to the end. Um, and that didn't do us much good if the handler happened to be looking the wrong way and missed that dog kind of sniffing at that thing on the way. Um, because when you're doing police tracking, one of the things you have to realize is you have to be focused on your environment as well as on your dog. So we learned to harness the scent picture. And if you think about it, you got two page pieces. You've got the human component. That is you shedding skin cells, sebum, and sweat, and products from your breathing that you know float in the air and fall to earth and create the trail the dog can follow of the human component. Then there's a ground component where uh, if you're walking on vegetation, you have a big spike of vegetative smells, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. And if you're walking on a hard surface, you have what is the product of the contact between the foot and that hard surface. There isn't nearly as much um, organic activity as a result of that. You'll get a transference of one material to another and whatever falls off your body stays around there. But if you think about this, this, um, this chart is adapted from the book Scent and the Scenting Dog by William Syrituck. Um, his wife, Jean Syrituck Whittle, gave us permission to uh, use this for education purposes a long time ago, and I'm very grateful for this. And it's, uh, you got to think of this in relative terms. These times will expand or contract depending upon conditions, as will the relative intensities. But if you take a look at the way this works, when somebody lays a track and you look at the vegetative component, wait a minute here, come on. If you look at this vegetative component, it goes up like this and makes an initial spike. And then at about a half an hour, it drops down to almost nothing. That spike around the first 15 minutes was the prime time we used to do our stuff when we were doing runoffs. Um, after that 30 minutes, the track, uh, the, the, the vegetative component will start to increase because what started out as a strong thing because of the release of chlorophyll and liquids inside the plant cells now lends uh, to putrefaction where the bacteria and things and the, the, the broken parts of the plant start to decay. They produce off-gassing or the bacteria eating them does, and then you see that part of the vegetative piece. The human component starts way down here and is overwhelmed by the vegetative spike for a while. Then it's a little bit stronger when you work up and goes up over there, and over time, it drops down substantially like this. So what we found was that um, by doing our short delay tracks, uh, we were working in the middle of that vegetative spike. When we were doing, when the dog was really motivated to chase after you, we were unintentionally teaching the animal to focus on the vegetative component. By, um, by adding delay, we could have gone away from that. But one of the problems you ran into is if you added delay too, long, too, too quickly, the dog wasn't prepared um, for that, didn't have the motivation to follow you because they didn't have that quick separation of you running off. And we, we had to find another way to do it. So our approach was to rethink the chain. And if you think about the chain, stimulus chains and behavior chains are all built on a couple of things. Um, they, they're most naturally created from the end to the beginning. In other words, the thing that gets paid or has a consequence the dog will either work for or to avoid uh, has something happens before that. 
And if it happens consistently before that, it becomes a predictor of that end. And if something happens before that thing, it predicts the, the thing closest to the end, which then predicts the end. And all of a sudden you see this chain go all the way back. And if any of you are police canine handlers, you know there are a bunch of police dogs out there that know their own call sign on the radio, know the words burglary in progress, know the alert tones that come on the radio, the beep, beep, beep. And then you'll hear the words robbery in progress or burglary or, or assault. And you'll see dogs start waking up in the back of the car, getting excited, especially when the handler starts accelerating, the lights come on and things like that. Now for you sport trackers, the same thing is gonna happen. Or for you search and rescue handlers, there will be antecedents that create this sense of arousal in the dog. Initially, they don't mean anything, but over time, if you're consistent with the presentation of those antecedents, they say, we're getting ready to do this thing now. And that's how back chaining occurs. Well, if it happens that way naturally through processes in the dog's day-to-day -day life, if we're smart, we harness that and we do the same thing. Um, it has some real advantages. One thing is, if you do it right, you're working towards the animal's strength, the thing that has the deepest reinforcement history. It gets paid a lot for doing it. It loves to do it. And next thing you know, um, you can attach other things to that thing at the end that it loves. Um, it also uh, gives you the ability to modularize your, your, your learning by separating the different components of a big chain behavior, work on them independently before you snap them together. Um, the one the one problem with the way I was taught to track early on was that you try to do everything all at once and then you try to make everything a little bit harder, a little bit of time here and there. Very imprecise and it created all sorts of unintended consequences. The other advantage of this, this approach, when you need to fix something, it's pretty easy to remedy them because you only need to fix a broken link to repair the chain. You just got to do a functional analysis of the chain, figure out which piece is broken what the antecedents and consequences for that are. And then next thing you know, boom, you're off to the races with a repaired behavior. So the chain for tracking is pretty simple. It's search for any, for any scent of a person on the ground that's there. Now, if you are using a scent article for search and rescue or something like that, that's great. I don't have a luxury of that because bad guys rarely leave something behind other than their footprints that I can follow. So we train our police officers to keep an area scent pure so that we can go ahead and start the dog there. The dogs will be trained also to exclude anybody but the track layer. So if you're a police officer who's walked over the track, if you're there, the dog knows to exclude you. But generally speaking, we want the dog following that track layer scent and nobody else's, whether it's from the start or at a cross track. Then, there's the final part of this chain, the report, which if there is an article left by the track layer, they drop a gun, they drop the, the cash or whatever they took, um, the dog should tell us that it found it. I prefer a down to report. Other people would prefer a retrieve. It doesn't matter. It's just got to be something that is consistent and that you can um, rely on to motivate the animal's behavior. Or if the animal finds the track layer himself, then you have whatever ending you have. If it's search rescue, there's going to be a party. Maybe not with the lost person because some of those people are scared and you're going to proxy that yourself by playing a tug game or having the dog come and tug your bringsel or tug its bringsel and then you'll play your game or you'll have the dog um, engage with somebody if that's your method. For us, it's like the dog will, will go ahead and take that person and pull them out of hiding. So police dogs really don't have a work ethic. They just think their daily life is nothing but like the best game of hide and seek and tug of war ever. And that's the way we want it. We want the dogs thinking this best thing. And they have to think that this is the central part of their life because it's the thing they bring to the equation that no other tool in the police inventory can do. So those behaviors are discrete. Search, follow, and report. So the question is, and by the way, follow is really a homogeneous chain of itself. It's follow us. You find that smell, find another thing that smells like it and another thing that smells like it and another thing that smells like it. Um, so it's really not a linear single event. It's that connect the dots picture that we're talking about. But when we teach the chain, we teach it kind of backwards. First thing I teach is the report because the whole chain is suspended from that thing. If you think of a behavior chain, like a chain hanging from a hook on the ceiling, 
the report has to bear the weight of the entire chain. It has the heaviest load. You get down to the last link in the chain, which for this would be the search, it actually has the least load. It doesn't have to do as much. So um, after you teach the report, you teach the follow. I choose to use the hit approach, which is um, a hard surface first approach, and we'll talk about it. But the reason we did it is we wanted to harness the power of classical conditioning to make dogs really love putting their nose down on pavement. So the beginning steps of this aren't even really tracking. It is a head lowering exercise, a classical conditioning exercise that then through operant procedures morphs into tracking. And once we get those pieces, we can teach the search. Once the dog likes to follow something and likes to report on something, we teach them how to find that track that's a little difficult where you don't really know where the start is and they've got to work it. And we'll use that skill, we'll teach that skill, but we'll also use the search as a gauge for the dog's readiness for the other pieces. If they're highly motivated, they will search for a while to find that thing before they get going on the track. So here's how the HIT system works. Um, basically, we harness primacy. We let the dogs um, start learning to track on hard surfaces. And then we manage the salience of the track by intensifying with water. Uh, water actually helps hydrate the bacteria, which are the primary source of the, vac of the, of the scent for the dog. They, it's the off-gassing that is really salient for the dogs. The human component itself, the skin rafts, can give the dog information that about that person as a distinct individual. But, and the, um, the sebum will also float to the top of the water because it's oil-based. Um, that water also provides an adhesive surface so that the skin rafts that come down have a place to stick when they hit the ground instead of skittering off with the wind. The beauty of using water, and, and we'll talk more about that later on, is that it's really easy for me to fade. You may have seen some of my old work from the on the internet from the um, early 90s and um, where we used scent in a bottle where we would actually take stinky t-shirts and soak them in unchlorinated water and put that in the bottle. And lo and behold, we found over the years that we didn't need that, that by using direct pairing of food and water, we could get rid of the guesswork of how intense that scent in that water was, just go with water and fade that out and the dogs performed every bit as well. Um, it's also a great remedial tool because when you're having a problem, you can bring back the spray as a way to touch up problem areas and give the dog a, a better chance of being successful with it and then fade that spray out easily and lo and behold um, your problem winds up just going away. So here are the, the 10 commandments of, of hit tracking. Um, the first thing to think about is this is a modular activity. You're going to build skills in components and little pieces in building blocks, Legos, however you want to conceptualize it for yourself. But we move through a world that has different parts and those dogs and those parts have effect on our dogs and dogs, therefore, have to learn how to handle those changes that the environment throws at them. We use non-chlorinated water. Why? Because chlorine has a scent of its own that's very salient to a dog and we don't want them learning to follow that. We want them learning to follow the human component. The other problem we've got is the chlorine is put in the water to kill bacteria. And so if you're spraying it on your track, you don't want it impeding the bacterial activity the track would normally have. Um, you can control the spray. So you start with a very tight spray that's very salient, has a very clear, distinct line with the pavement. And as the dog progresses, that spray gets wider. You lift the, the nozzle on the sprayer up a bit farther. You uh, spread the spray out so that it has less distinct edges and it, eva it evaporates more quickly and until eventually the dog is working on surface that was sprayed, but then has evaporated and is now dry. And then you just will intermittently use the spray maybe to touch up turns and surface changes. And then you're, then you get rid of it completely. Um, we teach on hard surfaces mm -hmm. first. Um, I usually, I used to say that we started on asphalt, then concrete, then, um, then gravel, then dirt, then grass. Uh, but uh, actually now, I go to gravel as quickly as I can because with gravel, I can get rid of the visual component and make it a more um, uh, 
a more purely olfactory activity. Um, finding gravel places to do that is a little tough, but roads work, construction sites when they're building have plenty of opportunities. And uh, I, I'm also not a, a <laughs> I'm not above hauling around a bucket of gravel in my patrol car. And then when I'm working on a hard surface, sprinkling gravel all over the place and the dog, the easiest way for the dog to solve the problem is to use its nose instead of its eyes because there's way more gravel than there is food. And the nose will lead it to food faster than its eyes will. And eventually they learn, don't bother the eyes, use your nose. So, um, but you got to have somebody other than the track layer take that bucket and sprinkle that stuff around. And then the track layer walks the route, drops the treats and they're there. We use vegetation is the last surface we teach. One way or the other, that's my preference um, because it is a, it's almost like it's a different skill. Once they get on that and they experience that vegetative spike, some dogs actually can't handle it and you got to kind of fade them into it gradually. Um, but over time, you still spray it. You still do everything else you do with the other, with all the other stuff, but it actually seems almost like a different activity to the dogs. And maybe that's why we had the problems before because when we trained on grass first and then went to hard surface, problems arose because maybe it was a such a different activity. The treats have to be small enough. The dog can not, doesn't need to take time to, to chew them up before swallowing them. They just got to be able to lap them up and go straight down the throat. So not only should they should be tiny, they be, should be soft and highly palatable. Something the dog really loves. Um, we use what we call the 80, 20 rule is that was when the dog is 80% successful on a track, we will change one variable by no more than 20%. It's a good way to keep yourself honest and we'll give you a system for looking at that a little bit later on. But that 80-20 rule keeps you moving forward so you don't get stalls and create training plateaus. It also keeps you from going too fast. Follow the rule and I guarantee you, you'll make more consistent progress. You have to build a love of articles if you're going to keep a dog nose down focused. Uh, there are some dogs that come out of the box. You love it. You know, people who work with bloodhounds, they just love to trail. And some of those dogs will quickly learn to keep, have a deep nose that stays close to the ground doing the process. Uh, but a lot of German shepherds, not so much. You get a Malinois that has come from Europe where all its work has been in KB, KNPV and it's never seen a tracking surface. Um, they are so visually oriented that sometimes it's hard to get them down. I'm not saying it can't be done but your workload shifts when you find dogs. So if you build a love of articles and the dog learns to, to, that finding articles is a lot of fun, they'll teach themselves to put their nose on the ground for it. When you run into a problem, when you, when you are adding a new skill, reintroduce spray. Once you fade spray out, doesn't mean it has to go away forever. Um, I've got veteran handlers that will start every day with a spray track of one sort or another just to kind of get the dog tuned up and throw something new at it it hasn't seen before. And the final thing is you must mm -hmm. embrace failure. You, you, things will not work out the way you planned. And every one of those things that doesn't work out the way you planned is an opportunity to figure out how to fill in gaps in your training plan. And um, so we try to keep exercises small for building modules. We do just tracks that are just long enough to address that module. So the failures don't stack up on top of each other, one or another in the same track. So here's what it looks like. When you start this process, um, initially, you'll walk along a line like this and drop treats down every four inches, basically the width of your palm. Then you'll come back around on the downwind side. Oops. And then you will spray with a tight spray of water walking alongside that, you'll leave a, you put a little starting pile of maybe three or four treats at the beginning and another one of three or four or five treats at the end. And those are there to help get the dog kind of focused on the ground. And then the ones at the end are there to keep the dog's nose on the ground. So you could then put treats in front of it, and lead them away. So the end of a track doesn't become a negatively punishing event. It's really important to keep this as, um, uh, Keep the dogs wanting more and so that's one of the ways we do it without having this um, this activity get a little boring for them um, you'll notice that four inch everybody says why so close it's in the beginning this is not tracking all you're doing is trying to create a classically conditioned association between water and food and water and and scent 
So the food is the primary enforcer that gets the dog there. The water becomes a vehicle for intensifying the scent and, and making it easier for the dog to follow. And at the same time, that's there, scent is being deposited. And basically you start extracting the food, then you extract the, the water, and then there's nothing but the scent for the dog to figure out how to find. So here's what it looks like laying that first track. And as you watch this process, you can see as I'm spraying here, I'm just walking along, holding it down, creating a nice tight line. And then as I come back around, I go to the downwind side and we'll add the reinforcers four inches apart. Really soft, little tiny morsels for the dog to just scoop up without even thinking about it. If you want to save your back, get yourself a PVC pipe and uh, get one that's a lot fatter in diameter than the treats that you're dropping down there so that it falls freely. And remember, lift the pipe up before you move it because otherwise it'll skitter your treat around. But that's an easier way. Now that I'm in my 60s, I appreciate not having to bend down so much. Um, but you can see how this all goes. You can see the treats being spaced very tightly. And you can see they look actually closer than they are because of the telephoto lens compressing the space. But you can see that they're roughly four inches apart once you get there. I know it seems a little, little silly for people who've been tracking for a long time, but if you do it, you'll find that the dog actually comes out. And this is a dog who he actually didn't want to put his nose down on the ground because he had been reinforced for a bunch of high speed tracking. And so this dog, uh, we spent about a couple of minutes before just spraying a wet spot on the ground and letting him eat some from his handler's hand. And then the oops, he dropped them. They went on the ground where the wet spot was. Rinse and repeat that three or four times, then bring him out. And then here's what he did. And the success was because we were so excited about the dog actually willing, being willing to put his nose down the ground. And you can see, this is what you're looking for is a, a dog that just stays steady on the, on the path and then works his way along. Um, once you get to the end, instead of doing what this guy does here, which is take him off with a lead, you want to get a, a treat down there and, and lead the dog out. Oh, I'm sorry. One escape too many. So, you know, I'm going to accelerate my way through the steps. I've, uh, I'll cut some out, but basically you're going to gradually start increasing this, increasing the spacing of the treats. And it may be eight inches. It may be six inches. What you're going to do is let the dog's behavior tell you which works. If they maintain a nice, steady, smooth gait, then you got it. The point of this is you want to build muscle memory so the dog has a nice biomechanically efficient style that they can keep up forever on those long, you know, tracks that are miles long and you want to get somebody. And you also want the dog being, um, you know, focused enough on the ground that they're not just skipping and cheating. And you'll see that when we get to longer spacing or wider spacing, that that will change. Um, after you get going for a while, uh, maybe you've gone from eight inches to 12 inches to 16 inches. When you get up around 20 inches, you want to start randomizing it. So you'll notice in this one here, these are about 20 inches apart. And then I got a closer one, maybe one a little farther then another one around 20. The whole point on that is dogs are, my wife says I'm supposed to be a professional and say nice thing and say they're opportunists. But we're all dog people. We know they will cheat at every opportunity. They are cheating mamajamas. They love to go ahead and just find the easiest way to solve the problem. And if they can solve the problem with their eyes, they will. And at this point, you're still just teaching head lowering. And they'll try and undo that. They'll, they will undo that. Not, not trying to undo what you're doing, but they'll try and solve the problem the easiest way they can. If they can pick their head up, see what that next treat is, and rush through it, they'll do it that way. So by randomizing it, it gets easier for you to go. It gets easier for them to solve a problem just by keeping their nose on the ground. All 
let's why is my screen there we go now we'll jump ahead here to handling turns if you decide you're going to start teaching 90 degree turns i recommend you do first do it while there's spray the spray stays the same all the way in there but increase your treats in the area of the turn so that as the dog is led into the turn and led out of the turn there's a few more treats then you go to your normal spacing do that a couple of times and then start fading out those extra treats when the dogs learn to handle the the turns after you've gotten rid of the spray and treats or after you've gotten rid of most of the spray you can keep a track dry or do it intermittently and then get a little heavier at the turn spray it around move from there um, the idea of, mo of changing the salience of the spray either by raising and lowering your wand. If you lower it, it's more salient. If you raise it, it's less salient and is spread over a broader area. Um, dogs will figure it out. And they, they really do have a wonderful capacity for uh, figuring these things out. Um, but before I start doing 90 degree turns, I actually prefer to do serpentines. And one of the things I don't want to do is work into the wind so that the dog jumps from one leg to another. So I'll work with the wind either crosswind or at the dog's back following this winding path. Looks kind of like this. Now you see him going off the track a little bit off the path. He's still in the learning phases. But as long as I have that steady nose down behavior, then that's what I want because we'll harness that later. And you can see the, the spray is no longer visible as he's going along there. By doing serpentines, you teach the dog to slow down because if it's a straight line, sometimes they will just blitz along. It's amazing how doing a serpentine in a parking lot where you use the uh, parking stall lines as a gauge. I'll go outside the end of one on one by about 18 inches and then hit the next one at the end of the stall line inside the edge of the stall line by 18 inches. I just do that kind of gentle pattern like that. And it has an amazing capacity for slowing dogs down as they start to do this. Um, so as you start doing this work, one of the things that you want to do is keep track of what you're doing. So we create a, a, a progress card. And the progress card gives us a way to figure out what's what's going on. So as you go through a track, you're going to record your date and the time. And you notice those times all have a plus whatever. Well, that's the amount of delay. So the time is military time. 2100 is 9 p.m. 0230 is 230 in the morning. Um, so as you're looking at this, we have the time of day. And then the plus 10 is the delay. How long did it take from the person that when they started walking that track until the dog started. The length is um, self-explanatory, 75 yards. Spray is six inches in width. Treat spacing is 18 inches between treats. Success rate, 86%. So because it's 86%, I'm gonna change one variable. It's over 80%, I'm gonna change one variable by 20% or less. Well, 20% of 75 yards is 15 yards. So I add 15 to 75, I get 90. Sorry, folks. Yes, you have to do math here. You don't have to, but it makes your life easier when things go wrong to be able to go back to your records and see where you ask for more than you prepared the dog to deliver. So this time we're going to do another one at 90 yards. Dog did that. He was at 94%. I like that a lot. Now, one of the things that we do is we don't always change the same variable. You try to mix up which variable you're changing. So in this particular one, we're going to change treat space. We're going to go to 24 inches. So again, trying to go for a gap that's about 20%. We go from there. Dog's at 90%. We'll change another one. Next variable we change will be spray width, making that spray a little less salient so the dog has to work a little harder, can't use its eyes so much to follow it. We'll keep going. Next one, we'll change delay, make that track a little bit older that changes the profile. In some ways it makes it weaker, in other ways it makes it stronger, but it definitely changes the profile. And you need a dog to understand that it has to work in that range. Then later on, we'll change treat spacing again. 
And this time you'll notice that it says 24 and then a slash and then 18-30. What that means, it's a 24 inch average with a range of 18 to 30, mixing it up so the dog can't really predict when the next treat treat comes and just starts scalloping with its head up and down, up and down, solving the problem. Uh, you'll notice uh, the next day that we come back, we've changed the date from the 7th to the 8th. The next day is the start of the shift of the night because we worked at nights. What we did is um, we started out where we were on the last one. Rather than trying to just automatically go up, we start out our day with a tune-up to see where the dog's at. Because we can, these are short and easy to set, we can do a lot of these head-lowering exercises in one day. When you get to real tracking, then it gets a, a more time-consuming activity. You know, the time to figure out where the track is, set it up so the track does the teaching for you, and uh, make sure that it's an environment that's appropriate for the dog, have it delayed appropriately, have the dog run it, pick up everything and move on to the next one. It takes a lot more time. But when you're in the head-lowering phase, you can get a lot of these done at night. It's not uncommon for us to do seven or eight in a night. Uh, but in the meantime, we'll talk about this next day. So we keep everything the same, dogs at 94%. Next time around, we'll change spray width and change it from eight inches to 10 inches. And finally on the last one, which is still successful, we'll change the length from 90 yards to 105 yards. The idea is bouncing around like this and not changing the same thing twice in a row keeps the dog from realizing it's getting harder. And one of the things that you wanna do is kind of just gradually sneak up on increasing difficulty. So now we've done the report and the follow, we teach the dogs to search for the start. And we teach the dogs to come at the start from different angles. Initially, they always come in on this angle over here, where you can see that they just slide in like that, roughly that the handler arcs in, like a plane coming down for a landing and the dog goes there, boom, they're, they're good to go, keep that up. But then we teach the handlers to bring the dogs in from another angle. And, you know, we vary at angle until eventually um, they learn to come in at a back angle and they have to correct and pull themselves back into it. Once they're good at starting at the square, the start of it is, we'll bring the dogs into the middle and teach them they have to figure out what the correct direction is. And we make sure that there's no reinforcement in this direction for them in terms of food, treats, or anything else for them to get paid for. And we just pay them in that direction. And you'll notice that um, as you do this, one of the things that the next things that you'll do is you'll back off from the track and make them search a little farther away to go find it. It's important that for the start, um, your, whatever your, you, uh, let's see, how do I put this? We like to call it a starting ritual, but it is actually a stimulus chain. And you want your stimulus chain for the start of the track to be consistent. It always is the same every time you do it. The equipment is the same, the walk-up's the same, everything as best you can, line it all up so that you can get the best result possible. And your goal is in the beginning is to get that smooth focused entry into the track and then to make it progressively harder for the dog and teaching the dogs. And you can make a decision on how you want to do it, but the handlers in my unit sp split. Half of them will do it down before the start transfer the, the, the snap from the collar to the harness. Uh, others will have the dog on the harness and walk up to the start and just use a verbal cue. Um, it, I, it, I don't see enough difference in their results for me to say that one is superior to the other, except when it's not consistent. If you are consistent, you'll get superior results. So figure out what your starting ritual is and make it really consistent. Once that dog's really solid for this, you can shape the search for the start by having the dog work farther and farther away from it and find their way into it. Start from the uh, downwind side at first, but eventually working from the upwind side so that they have to, they'll literally go over it and then pull themselves back onto it. Now, teaching the report. Uh, again, we prefer the down at article. That's, that's our approach. I like a stable position because it keeps them near the track or at least near an object that was tossed from the track. So our chances of the dog picking up the track and going on from there are good because usually we don't we don't end tracks at articles. Um, it's not like a sport track. We're looking for a bad guy. Um, the uh, articles may be a, a double, a single, double, or triple, 
on this, if I may use the sports metaphor, but the home run is always finding the bad guy. And so for us, we will want the dogs to be ready to pick up the continue the track from one article to the next. Uh, we don't require that they point down in the direction of the track. We, we just care that they indicate to us that it's there. Whatever your report behaviors, whether you use a retrieve, whether you use a down, whether you use a sit or stop and stare, I don't care. But it's the foundation for any animal that's going to be functional in tracking operations. They've got to be really, really robust with their report behavior. It has to have short latency. In other words, the instant it smells that object and confirms that was laid by the track layer, they got to start the motion, whatever it is, whether it's dropping to the down. And we'll talk about the down. It has to have a long enough duration that the handler can get from the other end of the tracking lead up to confirm that the object is there and be able to pay the dog. And it has to be resistant to distraction because in our operating environment, there are cars driving by, people on bicycles, joggers, you know, pedestrians, other animals. And so the dog's got to be stay focused on tasks so that they're ready to continue from there. I can't emphasize enough. Everybody thinks their dog's ready for this mm -hmm. and they find out that, nope, their dog's down is not as strong as they thought it was. Get it strong and robust before you make it a report behavior. Then make that report, that object, a cue for the down and the animal will still love it. If you're busy trying to fix the down while it's attached to the track, you may wind up poisoning them both. So we, we have a sneaky way to introduce articles on the track and we talk about a short, simple track. Um, we adhere to uh, one of the laws of shaping from Don't Shoot the Dog, Karen Pryor's book. This says anytime you raise one criterion, you temporarily relax other criteria. And I'm going to add, I'm going to say, and briefly, if you spend a lot of time with those lowered criteria, the, the animal will uh, you know, adjust to that. And now you'll have to reshape that back up. So we quickly um, and, and briefly lower our other criteria and make this an easy track because the important thing that we're working on is just teaching the article. And we put the area at a, at a barrier or a box canyon. Uh, I prefer chain link fences, and we'll talk about that. As the dog approaches that mm -hmm. article, just prior to its reaching it, we will give the verbal cue to down. So that when it, it, you've got to kind of watch your dog, and when you're aware that the animal is aware the object's there but hasn't finished investigating it yet, you cue it so that just as its nose reaches there, you say the down cue. And they'll start to pair that odor in the, of the object that smells like the person they're following with your down cue. And you keep that up and don't stop until the animal beats you to it. When you see the animal starting to beat you to the down, then you can start thinking about withdrawing it, let the article be the cue by itself. But at first, you just let it predict the cue until it becomes the cue. I like to deliver my reinforcement at the article so I don't call them back to me. I go up, I deliver my reinforcement at the article. That allows me to then take the lead at a shorter distance. And when we cue them to track on from there, I can pay the lead out instead of having it at the end and work, working from there. So here's the box canyon or the, the fence. And basically what you see up here is a chain link fence. Track runs up to the chain link fence like this. And there's a gate. The track layer will spray and treat all the way up to the article, drop the article there, turn off the spray, go through the gate, close it behind them, and walk away. If the gate becomes a barrier to the dog going too far. They can only go side to side. And it makes it more likely that they'll actually comply with the down cue when you give it. it um, we found that when we did it this way, it's a, I will admit it's a cheat. I'll cheat just as much as the dog will. But I got to tell you, it cut the time it took for dogs to really get downing at articles by about a third. It, it was fast. And now um, literally we can get a dog downing on articles in a day once they really truly understand downing at articles out of the tracking condition. And that's, that's magic for us. So we, like I said, we stick with the chain link fence, we go through the gate. And then over time, what you'll do is you'll back off from the gate. You'll move from here back to here, back to here, farther and farther back until the gate is no longer the predictor of the articles there, the dog is down again, things right here. Boom, you're ready to move on to the next skill set. So we want you to think of, of your tracking process as a module activity. Anything your dog hasn't seen before on a track is something that you get to embrace and lean into as something to train. Surface changes, changes in level going up or down stairs, 
dogs think stairs are something to be surmounted. They don't pay attention on the tracks. And it, we have, uh, I live on a city that is built like Rome, is like Rome. It's built on seven hills. And we have stairs going up and down hills through green belts all over the place. And I hate to tell you this, but suspects aren't nice enough to go all the way to the top of stairs before they decide to bang a left and, and disappear. They will go halfway up the set of those stairs and jump into the woods. And if you have a dog that's just considering trying to get to the top, they will miss that. So you have to teach them, literally teach them to track upstairs. Not all dogs will do it. Some dogs are using others, but you can check it off if it if you if you do it. It's fun. Just put two steps, two treats on each step, one at the lip, one halfway, and spray it heavily and watch. Eventually, they'll start out wanting to vault vault over it. But if you just keep it up, they'll pick up the idea. Um, we also will have them go across bodies of water, and we also like to use water that simulates spray. So we'll use um, we'll track at night where there's um, sprinkler runoff from landscaping. And that runoff comes off in little rivulets and you'll see dogs try and follow it. Then they'll realize, wait a minute, this doesn't smell right. They come back to the track and they, they learn to ignore that stuff. Uh, we do it for different tracking conditions. So everything we teach the dogs, let's say we have an academy running the winter, we find that we have to brush everything up as the summer comes on. When weather changes, a lot of dogs, their tracking will, will change. It will kind of be ruined. Um, longer delays and gaps in the track. We actually train gaps in a track because we simulate the loss of a track and the opportunity to reacquire it. And now finally, when you're teaching transitions, one of my favorite techniques to borrow from some sport trainers is called the circle track. And you'll see that this circle goes across asphalt, concrete, grass, and gravel. And as somebody lays this track and the dog starts to work it, the track player will just in these early stages, we'll just walk along behind them, filling the back in with treats so the dog can go around there three or four times. And a 10 meter track, then this whole track around here is, is going to be pretty close to 33 meters. And you have a, a lot of time. 66, wait a minute. It's long. And you spend a lot of time getting a whole lot of reinforcement in there and surface transitions. It speeds the process up of tra training transitions in, in ways I can't even begin to describe. And I want to thank my friend, Mike Breton, for turning me on to the idea. Um, again, he took what we did and he came up with a better idea and I want to give him full credit for it. We also use spray to manage discrimination, cross tracks and things like that. We manage salience by adjusting or uh, making the spray more salient at the point of the cross track. We take into account wind direction. We start on um, the cross track or the person they're discriminating against a bystander being on the downwind side, work until they're more enticing and, and get ourselves past that. You can use spray to get you through so many aspects of what you're doing. And in the end, um, you got to remember, this is a back chained activity. That's why we're calling this back to front. Teach the report, get the dog to love reporting on articles, and then you can sneak them into learning to follow a track to get to the articles. And you get a dog that's highly motivated to keep its nose on the ground for ground level objects. And you wind up with far fewer problems of dogs sprinting around uh, like a March hare. Um, I'm a firm believer in hydration intensified tracking training because I love to harness the classical conditioning it makes. You watch dogs hit pavement and they actually get calmer. They settle down, they focus, and all these places where we lost people before, we're getting them now because of this. And modularize your training. Think of surfaces, transitions, contamination, distraction, weather, you name it. It's all part of the process. Um, I, you know, this covers the whole presentation. If you want more information, you got to remember that um, it, it's going to be available on the next slide. This is the most fun you're ever going to have with a dog. I'm one of those weird people that loves tracking training and watching tracking dogs. Not everybody does, but for me, it's like watch the dog solve that problem is the neatest thing around, especially when it happens when there's a bad guy and you come around the corner, this person thought they got away and lo and behold, there they are. And for you SAR, search and rescue handlers, there's no feeling in the world. It, you know what I'm talking about. When you, you your dog comes around and there's that person who thought everything was, they were a goner. And here you are with your dog, bringing them back for everybody else. 
If you need some more information, you can give me an email at steve at proactivecanine.com. If you want to get some videos, they're available for download or DVDs at Tosser Dog at the two addresses listed here. Just go to Tosser Dog, plug my name into the search bar and it'll come up. Um, I think we're almost out of time, but I want to make sure that um, I'm staying with Wayne and what he's got going here. So the ball's in your court, brother. Right. Thank you, Steve. That was very eye-opening. I uh, just want to thank everyone for attending. Um, hopefully, once all this insanity is over, we'll have Steve down for the Australian Canine Conference. Um, other than that, everyone that's attended, I've recorded it and we'll put it for upload.